So RNA uh, at the root, uh, it's defined by a statement. And the statement says that DNA makes RNA, and RNA makes protein. And this is called the central dogma in biology. And you have, I'm sure, heard of DNA. Some of you may or may not have heard of RNA. I'm sure you've heard of protein. So if we, let's take a show of hands. Uh, how many of you have heard of insulin? Raise your hand. Okay, good number of you. Uh, how many of you have heard of growth hormone? Raise your hand. Some of you, okay, good. Collagen? Yes? So pretty good. Um, how many of you have heard of LET7? LIN4? Near 124. Okay, <laughs> these are all RNAs. So it's the one in the middle, and it really gets no respect because everyone knows the proteins, those are the ones that get the glory. Everyone knows the DNA because those are the ones that get the movies, the TV shows, the paternal tests, uh, all those uh, things that, that make it noticeable. But RNA, um, is, is really neglected. And so um, it's actually structurally very similar to DNA. And these are the chemical structures of RNA and DNA side by side. And there's only one little difference between the two. And it's a hydroxy group at the bottom, which is pointed out. Uh, and in DNA, it doesn't have this group. And that's why it's called uh, deoxy or deoxyribonucleic acid versus RNA, which is ribonucleic acid. And so if you think about RNA, it's actually doing some of the most important things in the cell. And from the central dogma, it's the one in the middle, it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And taking DNA to make protein it goes through first one part called mRNA, or messenger RNA. And this RNA, it's like a string, and it has sequences that are transcribed from the DNA. And in another part, it has what's called the transfer RNA. And so this is another kind of RNA that actually makes itself into a different shape. And this is more like a cross structure, as you can see, and it's a bit smaller. And it acts as the adapter that puts the code of the DNA from the RNA and makes the protein. And then it has a third piece, uh, which are uh, a small one and a larger one. And for lack of a better term, this is kind of a blob, but it's a complex of three different RNAs in one of the subunits and around 50 proteins. So not only is it very flexible and able to make itself into different sizes and different shapes, but it's a good coworker. So it can work with proteins and do a lot of interesting stuff like make proteins from DNA. Now lately, there have been more types of RNAs, and these are uh, some smaller ones, some larger ones, and they're much more recent. So for many years, we thought of RNA as being the top three or four on, on this slide. But now we know there are a whole host of different types of RNAs. And one is called a peewee RNA, and the function of this small RNA uh, is to actually prevent uh, genetic elements from moving in and out of the genome. So it's like the policeman in the cell. Then there's a snow RNA, or small nucleolar RNA, and this RNA helps guide proteins and complexes to ribosome units, so it's like a tour guide and a taxi driver. And then you have long non-coding RNAs, or LNC RNAs, and these act 
at the end of chromosomes to help uh, construct ends with a protein called telomerase. And so it's like a construction worker. There's antisense RNA, another type. And this is to keep the really bad RNAs in the cell, long ones, in check. So it's like the jailer. And then there's small nuclear RNA. And this one actually um, helps to maintain messenger RNA to keep it, it perfectly in shape to translate into protein. It's also working only in the nucleus, and so it's like the stay-at-home mother of the armies. Then the last one, it's a really special one. It's the microRNA, and the reason it's special is because it controls the amount of mRNA in a cell. So if you have too much mRNA, it will make it less. And if, if you don't have enough, it'll disappear and you'll have plenty of it to make protein. So it's kind of like the government bureaucrat of the cell. So it's doing um, a lot of uh, different things uh, in, in different ways. And there are, are indeed even more classes than this. So I want to talk a little bit more about this class, the microRNA. And if you look at the structure of it, it's about 75 to 80 pieces of RNA together that makes this structure. And it looks like a hairpin. Indeed, it's called um, hairpin RNA in some places. And it can cut in different places. So the dotted lines show where it's cut. And from these cuts, it can break into at least four pieces that are active. And so it's uh, very dynamic in that it's not only using one part of itself, but it's using many different parts of itself, and it's not wasting uh, any. If we continue and we look uh, what it's involved in, as I said, it's, it's the government bureaucrat. So sometimes you have too much mRNA in your cell, and you have to control it. You have to bring it down, and if you bring it down, then you won't uh, make, make proteins. And so uh, you need this, uh, and it goes there by first recognizing the mRNA it needs to regulate. And then uh, that's the green part showing the mRNA. And then it will bring along some proteins to cut up that mRNA. And once that mRNA is cut up, due to the central dogma, then protein will not be made. From that. So this is how uh, it works to decrease um, uh, proteins in the cell, and that's a really handy thing to do. So you may wonder, well, it's a government bureaucrat, okay, how does it control itself? Well, it has its own self-control mechanism. So it has negative feedback, positive feedback, double negative feedback. So it has a way of rendering itself inactive when it needs to, and active uh, when it needs to. So this is kind of nice. It's uh, fun to work with in the laboratory. But what does it mean? How is it important to us? Well, scientists have taken these ideas and this knowledge, and they have applied it in the clinic. So this set of functions where you decrease the amount of messenger RNA in order to decrease proteins uh, is known uh, either as RNA interference or gene silencing. And using this idea, uh, there have been clinical trials where RNA targeted at proteins that are necessary for tumors to grow have been uh, used to actually decrease those proteins. And if the tumors don't have those proteins, then they can't grow. And in fact, they actually disappear. And so this is one example where, if we go back. So this is one example. If you look at the black arrows uh, in pretreatment, those dark spots are within a liver, and they're metastatic tumors. And from there, after 12 doses, 
of an RNA encapsulated in a nanoparticle, after 12 doses, it can decrease uh, those tumors. And after 40 doses, you hardly see it at all. And there are a couple of examples here, one in the top row and one in the bottom row. So that uh, is one application. Another application is with hepatitis B. Hepatitis B infection affects over 300 million people on this planet. And around 1 million die from the consequences of infection every year. And the results using gene silencing or RNA interference are actually even better with hepatitis B. And so the target here is now the RNA made uh, by the virus particle shown here. The viral genome will make the RNA, the RNA will be targeted. And then the surface antigens, the proteins that are made from that RNA will no longer uh, be made because the mRNA is not there anymore. And so far, uh, they have shown uh, in clinical trials that a single application of RNA can decrease proteins from the virus by 99%. So it's a very promising area. There are other applications as well. In my lab, we study this animal, which is a tiny worm called C. elegans. And this worm is shown with green fluorescent protein. The small green dots are neurons in the animal. And we're looking at ways where we can use RNA to decrease genes to prevent neurodegeneration of these neurons, to look at how these animals age and to work out different mechanisms on how neurons go through the neurodegenerative process. So it's an excellent model for this. And it's also a very popular model because microRNAs were discovered in this animal. Later, the microRNAs were found in almost all animals on this planet, including humans. So it's a great model. So, as I mentioned earlier, the theme here is, is root. So now I want to just tell you a little bit about where these ideas come from and what motivates us for doing this. And so the first uh, thing that comes to mind is who motivated me to become a scientist? And I have to say it was my father. So he wasn't a scientist, he was a cook, actually. But he took me to the horse racing track. And at the horse racing track, we were able to look at the form that shows the past performances of the horses. And we noticed that by the powers of observation, by doing statistical analysis, by looking at predictive methods, we could see uh, what would happen at the racetrack. And that's what I have been using uh, ever since. So he won a little bit, he lost a lot, but we always had a really good time. And so he never told my mother how much he actually lost, so I hope my mother doesn't actually see this. Uh, but if she does, it's okay, because my mother was the one who took me to the casino. So in that case, um, I also learned number theory from, from there as well. Okay, so. Um, those are uh, some of the early motivations I had. Another uh, motivation is from one of my students, and her name is Sudi Asikan. And I have to say, at the beginning, I was not really interested in small RNAs. I would be just happy to study mRNAs the rest of my life. But she was very convinced that this was a field ripe to study, and she was actually right. And she was able to discover and identify three classes of small non-coding RNAs in different places, such as worms, such as human stem cells. Another student, Petri Tudrenin, uh, he was actually a total catastrophe in the laboratory. He was terrible. We would find his experiments that he had forgotten in the incubator, his tubes floating in the water baths, but he was very good in computation. 
in encoding and in programming. And at the time, he was able to analyze 6,000 genes being regulated at one time over seven conditions, which made for 42,000 data points and interpreted. And now that field is known uh, as bioinformatics. And for a person 20 years ago who applied that using uh, programming and artificial intelligence methods, it really tells you uh, what is needed uh, these days to study uh, RNA at this level. So the story of RNA, it's still not finished. So there are many different RNAs that we have talked about today. There are still RNAs left to study. At the top left, there is what's called other or uncategorized transcripts, miscellaneous RNAs, and those are, are right to find out uh, what, what they do, what is their function in the cell. And then finally, um, where, is, where is it headed? Well, if you look at Moore's law, this is the law that states that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every 18 months. And this is behind the big explosion in all the devices that you have, your mobile phones, the internet, um, your, your tablets, whatever you're using for computation. Well, the cost for sequencing RNAs and DNAs is actually happening uh, or decreasing faster than Moore's law. So we're able then to predict that there will be more to come from RNAs. So RNA it has a story to tell. It may save your life someday. It may make you a million dollars, or you may study it for fun, for curiosity, for knowledge. Army. Thank you very much.